This morning I'm reading the scripture from Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Deacon. Thank you, Michael and Ray, and uh, for uh, and choir for your music leadership. Michael, it's good to have you back. We're so thankful to have you back. And we're also, again, thank you for Deacons, and we especially want to recognize it. Sorry, I failed to do this earlier. The families of Deacons who came to be with us here today as they share in this special moment. So uh, I can see the Morris family here, and uh, it's welcome, welcome. And so many others of you who came out to support our Deacons. We're so grateful. Today, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about humility and pride. And when I always think about humility, I am reminded of a situation that came up very early on in my pastoral ministry, several, uh, many years ago, when one of my mentors, a retired Baptist minister, told me, very straight out, get over yourself. Now you may think he said it because I was so proud of something a victory at church, or some writing endeavor, a breakthrough, perhaps a sermon well received. But I remember very clearly that it was actually quite the opposite. I was in one of those ministerial doldrums that we pastors get in. You know, sometimes we pastors get the pastor blues. I encourage you to, to pray for staff, and if you talk to friends, encourage them to pray for their pastor, because we pastors inevitably, every once in a while, get into the pastor blues. I haven't met one pastor who hasn't been in some way or another a people pleaser or a perfectionist. And sometimes when things don't go right or things go awry, it can really ruin our day. For a new, inexperienced pastor or a young pastor, it can ruin an entire week. I'm not sure what happened, and I'm not sure what was said, but I do remember very clearly having one of these bluesy weeks when my mentor told me, get over yourself. Get over it. And that's where we are when we find ourselves within the scripture lesson in today's text in Matthew chapter 3. John is out in the wilderness preaching what the Gospel of Luke calls the good news of the repentance of sins. He's preaching about the coming reign of God, and he is baptizing people there in the wilderness in the Jordan River. Now back then, this was very symbolic. It really served symbolic in several ways. For one, when you were baptized, it was a symbol that you were coming clean with God. That as you were being immersed, you were making a commitment to be cleansed, an act of purification, a ritual of cleansing, so that you might live differently, a way of repenting for your sins. It was an act of worship. And it was one done way out in the wilderness, apart from the temple, because many people, many Jews back then, thought that the temple was actually quite corrupt with its uh, aristocracy and all of the meddling that the Romans did. Many people went out into the wilderness in order to form new or alternative communities, and one of the ways you would enter into that community is to be baptized in this ritual cleaning. In fact, if you've heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls, just as an example, those that was a community out in the wilderness uh, in which we know through our uh, excavation that they had ritual cleansing baths where the people who kept the Dead Sea Scrolls would have been baptized as a way of coming out from what they saw as the corrupt temple system. Now another more clear symbol is that it reenacted that old story from Exodus of the Israelites coming out of enslavement of Egypt into the new land and the new way that God had for them. And so being baptized in the Jordan River was a lot like passing through those waters from enslavement to freedom. Or, if you think of Joshua and your Old Testament stories, uh, of entering into the new promised land, of living a life different than what you were before. 
So John was out there baptizing in this very different community. Also, not only baptizing, but also preaching the coming of the Messiah. He must have heard over and over again from his parents of his miraculous birth to Zachariah and Elizabeth. And he probably heard over and over again that you, John, would be the one to set the stage and to announce the coming of the Messiah. And so his message in verse 11 is very simple. I have come to baptize you with water for repentance. But one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. And I am not worthy to even tie his sandals. And really that's John's motto and mantra. I am not worthy. I'm not worthy. And this one is going to be more powerful than I. And his humility is wrapped up in that mantra over and over again. I am not worthy. I mean, have you seen how the guy dresses after all? You know, this isn't one who would show up to church in a suit. He had kind of a sack, sackcloth, kind of a canvassy kind of clothing. He ate locusts and honey. He was a bit of a rugged guy. And so we know that him not being worthy is one that he really embodied and lived into. And so in this text, when we see that Jesus gets in line to be baptized, perhaps Jesus stuck his head out and waved to his cousin John, John's response was immediate. And verse 14 tells us that John would have protested against Jesus, or baptizing Jesus. He would have protested against baptizing Jesus, rather declaring that he should be the one getting baptized by his cousin. One translation says that he tried to prevent Jesus. And, and I like the King James Version personally. It says that John would have forbade Jesus from, being, from getting baptized and insisted that John would be baptized by Jesus instead. And this statement that John gives to Jesus is one I'm sure all of us would say, in fact, if Jesus showed up to your house, you would probably fall on your knees like any of us would, and we would automatically think that we are not worthy. Who is Jesus to ask us to baptize him? And so in this verse, John communicates all of his insecurities and all of his anxieties. I am not worthy. I'm no good. I am not powerful. I can't even tie your shoes. And I am not special. You know, I've heard this a few times from, from deacons. There is not one year that goes by in which I do not hear at least one deacon tell me, or one person who's been nominated, tell me, I, I can't be a deacon, why would I be nominated? I, I don't pray that much, I don't know my Bible that well, I'm not very spiritual, and I always have at least one, if not more, deacons say, you know, I'm not worthy to do this, I'm not spiritual enough to do this, I can't serve, I, I don't know what I'm doing. And I'm always reminding those who are nominated that people chose you because of who you are, not because of what you pretend you want to be. And the fact that you show up is half the battle, that you're present, and that it's a gift to serve. And so receive the gift and give the gift back by serving well. And I hear this all the time, just like John on that desert stream so long ago. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. And Jesus answers John with a very specific answer in uh, the next verse, in which Jesus says first, let it be so now. It's another way of saying that God has called you to do this right now. This is the season in which you're going to baptize me. Let it be so now. You know, when God calls you, God will give you the gifts to do what God wants you to do. When God expects you to do something or asks you to do something, He will give you the strength. You may think you're out of your league. You may think that you're not worthy. You may think somehow that for some reason you're not spiritual enough or you may not know the Bible well enough, but I promise you if God calls you to do something, God will give you the strength. And often, God will give you the strength even in the midst of your weakness. For Jesus, he was telling John, this is what God has you to do right now. God is calling you now. Let it be so in this season. To, for you to do this thing right here and to serve right now. And then Jesus says, it is proper for us to do this. Notice that Jesus doesn't say it is proper for me. Jesus doesn't say it is proper for you. Jesus says it is proper for us. And Jesus knows that 
he is in this together with John, that we're all in this together to serve, that we're all called at this time to do what God has asked us to do, to fulfill the purpose to which God called us. And Jesus puts himself squarely within that community. He doesn't stand out himself. He, he doesn't put John on the spot. He rather basically tells John, we can do this together. We're going to be, we're going to do this together. We're all in this together. In other words, Jesus is telling John, get over yourself. You may come off, it may come off as being humble, but self-pity and self-doubt is really just another form of pride. Because although you're not thinking highly of yourself, even though you may say, I'm not worthy, I'm no good, I'm, I can't serve, you may not be thinking highly of yourself, but you're still placing yourself at the center of your story. And so it is pride. Get over yourself. And Jesus helps John get over himself by committing to that act of baptism. And Jesus really leads as a model of example here. You know, Jesus didn't need to get baptized. John was baptizing for the remission of sins. We know that Jesus was sinless, God in human form. And so we know that Jesus got baptized not to wash his sins, but rather to stand in solidarity, solidarity with the very people he longed to save. It was Jesus' act of humility to do what God had asked him to do in order to remind people that he was one of us, that he walks with the common folk that he longs to save. And he gives us a model of leadership. This is leadership by example. Leadership, according to Jesus, by first submission. Submitting himself to that act to which God has called him. Humility is about submitting ourselves. But it's also about servanthood. Jesus was not concerned with playing the Messiah card right away. We know that right after he gets baptized in this act of solidarity, that Satan, that he's drawn out into the wilderness, and there, in fasting in the wilderness, Jesus is tempted by Satan, in which Satan basically asks him three times in three different ways, you're the Messiah, you can do this, you don't need God, you can do this yourself, you can take the fast track to power. You can take matters into your own hands, you don't need to wait for God's provision. In fact, if you buddy up with me, we're going to rule the world together. And Jesus refuses to do it. Because he knows that leadership is by way of humility, which is submission and service, and in being rooted in a community to set things right. Notice what the sentence says in that verse. Let us do this, because it is proper to do so, to fulfill all righteousness. It's another way of saying we're in this together, we're going to make things right with God. And then Scripture tells us that he consented. Now, we don't know if John consented. Some of your translations may say that John consented, but the Greek is pretty ambiguous. It says then he consented. So we don't know if John consented finally to Jesus, or if Jesus finally consented in the act of baptism. My guess and my money is on John. Because what we know is that Jesus condescends to us. It's an old-fashioned word. It's a word we have in our hymns. Of Jesus who stepped down out of heaven to be with us, he condescends to us that we might consent to him. And John, in this act of following the humble Messiah, humbles himself and finally consents to baptize Jesus. See, humility is about consenting. It's about consenting to submit to God despite your doubts. See, we're all full of doubts. And not one of you has any more scarier doubts than any one of us and anyone else. We all have scary doubts that we live with every day. Questions that we can't answer, questions that we ponder, questions that may even tempt us to stay home from church. But when we consent in humility and get ourselves out of the center of our story, we're willing to submit to God despite our doubts. Consent means to serve God despite our insecurities. Deacons, we didn't nominate you because you were perfect. We nominated you because of who you are. And Christian, we don't expect you to be perfect in this place. We expect you to be who you are and to allow Christ to meet you where you are, but we expect you not to stay where you are and to grow with Christ. To serve despite your hesitations. 
And consent and humility is about moving beyond yourself despite your insecurities. Now you may say, hey, Joe, I'm not worthy. I'm no good. I'm a terrible person. I'm not perfect. This is familiar, by the way, because this is what goes on in my household. I'm no good. I'm terrible. I don't feel right today. I don't want to go to church. But honey, you're the pastor. I don't want to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> and you know you get into this, right, with the spouse? I don't know why you love me. I mean, don't even look at me. I'm terrible. How can you stay? How can you wake up and see me every day? But we have known, because I've preached this to you more than once, and it's really me preaching myself, that you choose how your day and how your attitude is. Your attitude in your day is a choice. So yes, you may not feel worthy, you may not feel perfect, you may feel like you're a terrible person. But the word today is to hear Jesus say to you, let it be so now, because I have called you to something greater. In other words, 